and welcome to the Purvis Versus podcast. My name is Eric Purvis. I am an RMT course creator, continuing education provider, and advocate for evidence-based massage therapy. Today's episode features an entertaining discussion with Carlos Grushi, who is a new RMT that practices in my hometown of Victoria, BC. Today we discuss his journey into the skepticism of what he was being taught in massage therapy school and how he is using his new knowledge in pain science and evidence-based content to better educate the public through social media and through his wellness coaching company. Our conversation evolves into entrepreneurship and the rewards and challenges of being an entrepreneur in the healthcare business space. And as a heads up, please know this episode does include some colorful and explicit language, so listen if you wish. Uh, so thank you for being here, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Well, thank you for attending another episode of Purvis Verses. This today I'm excited to have uh, Carlos Grushi, uh, but apparently he goes by he prefers Grouchy, and I think that sounds way cooler as well. So thanks for being yeah. here today, today Carlos. Yeah. Uh, just kind of tell us a little bit about. Yeah, thanks you. for having me. Yeah, introduce yourself. Tell the audience uh, who you are and what you're all about. Okay, so Carlos here. Um, I'm a massage therapist, registered massage therapist, practicing in Victoria right now. I uh, have lived here for about ten years. In terms of like sports background, I played hockey competitively. That was kind of my thing growing up. But now I'm just. I pretty much enjoy absolutely anything and everything with moving the body. I got into triathlon through COVID. And now I'm really into more, a bit more, a bit more mountain biking, always been kind of into weight training and I've been doing massage for four years now. I graded in spring 2019. So that's kind of where I'm at. And then I also do some personal training, stuff like that. And that's a bit of a background I had with working at a training company for professional collegiate and like teen hockey players. Nice. We met, I, did I connect with you? Like, I think, did I meet you when you were a student? Cause you went to WCCMT in Victoria. Yeah. Right? You, yeah. You and uh, Jamie, Jamie Johnson, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the guy's name? Jamie? Yeah. yeah. You guys came in for a little kind of demo with movement modifiers, stuff like that. And I think that was the first time I had exposure to you. Yeah. 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 That's what, that's what I thought. Yeah. So. Um, Cause I know, um we've connected a few times online and stuff over then and, and you took took one of my courses one time and uh um i remember you you seemed yeah. from somebody that was like a new grad or somebody like fresh you had a lot of good questions and you had a lot of like kind of thoughts and skepticism which is something that i always like this guy's got something um i like it i like i like the way he's yeah it. yeah <laughs> yeah so we'll get into yeah it was well it was interesting yeah go ahead Sorry. yeah we'll get into that no, but, well, it was uh, interesting because I'd say like school was a bit of the kind of halfway through some stuff I was dealing with personally with pain, which I'm I'm sure we'll get into in a bit. It was sort of like, I don't think everything here is kind of being spoken about in the right way. And so like the skepticism started pretty early and I'm just a skeptical person overall, I'd say. So I was kind of just like, smelt a bit stinky. And then when there were a couple teachers that said certain things and you guys came in, I was like, oh, okay, like this, this makes more sense and things shouldn't be overly complicated. Like if they are, it's usually people are just bullshitting. I think. I, I love that you saw that because it is so true that uh, we oftentimes as students, we just kind of just take the BS that we're fed to us because we have to, because we don't know any different and, and, we, yeah. and we have to pass these exams. But uh, yeah, I, I spent a lot of years, actually, I, I probably went three or four years in a row, I went into WCCMT. And I don't think there's any surprise why I haven't been invited back in a long time. Because I think it became a little bit, uh, 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 probably some conflict between what some of uh, what some of the students were saying, and uh, the faculty was saying, and I think there's probably admin, and some of the, the people that run the school probably were like, mm, no, we don't want him here anymore. Uh, Maybe I'm wrong, yeah, but uh, yeah, there's been a few times where I've been invited into schools and I've had great feedback and lots of information from the the, the staff member that's invited me, as well as the the students have reached out like, this is great. But then the 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 higher ups are like, no, it's too controversial. I'm like, yeah, the truth, the truth <laughs> is controversial. I can totally see that. Yeah. Don't tell the, yeah, truth. the truth is controversial. Yeah. 
The truth will not set you free anymore. You're no, fucked. no. The truth will the keep truth. you away. It doesn't keep you away from us. So yeah. Anyway, yeah. For uh, real. So let's let's. Uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll talk more about that. But I know you've got uh, one reason I wanted to reach out to you and have you on here. Well, there's many reasons, but one of them I know you started your new uh, symmetry wellness coaching business, and you've got some fantastic videos and content on your Instagram page, which I I really applaud you for for doing that. I think I think it's fantastic. Uh, but just tell us a, l- a little Thanks. bit about it. Tell tell us about your your new business and what it's all well, about. Okay, so what I kind of started there is a bit of like, well, initially, like I wanted to bring some of the stuff that I would say, like people like you have exposed me to that I find quite quite helpful. And one of the things that I've found quite interesting in that side of the education is like, don't don't pain explain people. Like, don't give them all the neuroscience and all that because it's like. They don't fucking care. It's overly complicated. They're not going to be able to digest it. And I mean, this is, I'd say probably most important overall. It's super boring to most people. Like me and you nerd out about it. Cause that's the shit we like. But for most normal people, they're like, dude, I don't even, like you said, central sensitization. Like I'm numb. I don't know what, I'm not listening to anything else that's coming out of your mouth. And so when I was thinking about making content and kind of, Like, who am I going to make content for and how am I going to like create it in a way that's engaging? Because there are a lot of people making content along these lines in terms of like, let's educate people, let's educate practitioners. Um, I kind of wanted to go a bit more of the like, let's educate the general public because the amount of people you can kind of contact in terms of like the practitioner area and they are are so set in their sort of biases already. And like their self fulfilling prophecies of like, well, I'm the greatest and I'm going to fix you. I was like, you know what? Like they're not that receptive. And there's a couple pages. I wish I could remember them. I think it's like Steve Kerr coaching. That's probably wrong, but they're more like fitness influencers. And what they do is they make kind of comedic videos on like weight training and strength training. And they sort of myth bust around that. And I was like, man, this content's great. Like I actually enjoy this and they slip in the science, which is I'd say the best part. So they're giving people a lot of literal guidance. That's, you know, science backed. I was like, well, how can I spin this to fit kind of the stuff that I want to communicate? And so the symmetry wellness coaching page is meant to be a bit of an amalgamation of like, the manual therapy, pain science stuff, a bit of like the strength conditioning, rehabilitation stuff. And then at some point, there'll probably be a bit of nutrition because I do love the nutrition space. And it's another space that's very like, holy shit, there are polar opposites of what's good and what's not and what's killing you and what's not killing you and everything should be alkaline. And it's just like, oh my God, this is incredible. Like people are just getting spoon fed a bunch of stuff that, you know, isn't the best. And so I'm hoping to build a bit of a platform where I can touch on each domain and really provide stuff that's educational, but also people won't be bored to death watching. But it's been an interesting little bit because like I have a personal Instagram account. I actually didn't make it. A previous partner made it for me. And there's one photo of me. Like I don't do social media. I hate social media. So it has been an interesting sort of, hey, let's let's try this out. Yeah. yeah, I think it's. I think I love what you've done there. I I found I I enjoy your videos. They're kind of like an Aaron Kubal esque kind of you know bringing in the science with a bit of humor and uh, they're, they're very creative. But what I what I find with them with what you've the content you put out there though is that it's there's not our RMTs doing that kind of work. It's usually physios or chiros or nutrition or fitness people. You don't really see like RMTs doing that kind of video or that kind of content because the stuff that you're doing is, is like, you're just you're just like bold and you're like this is a big fucking waste of time. I think you said in in one about stretching or something. Yeah. You, you said so much at lunch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think I think it's great. I mean, no, I, I, it's not neat for everybody, but it's 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 yeah, super totally. entertaining. Yeah. That's yeah. Great to hear. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Great to hear. No, it's definitely something that I I totally agree there with it. It is more physios or strength conditioning coaches that are kind of putting that stuff out. And, but it's, it is the stuff that I enjoy the most. So I was like, why don't I just do this? And you know, the title of RMT is 
I mean, so many people have these titles and it's kind of like, well, what actually like relevant experience do you bring or like what experience have you developed through the years? And so I'm kind of just like, yeah, the title might be a bit different to what is more commonplace, but like, I don't know who gives a shit. And I have a background in all these other domains. And so why not? Yeah, that's great. Do you, what, what kind of engagement are you getting with your stuff? Like, it's pretty new to you, isn't it? Like, it's, it's actually been, it is pretty new. It is really new. Um, it's been pretty good, especially in the beginning. I mean, a lot of that was just because I think in the, initially people who know me personally were like, what the hell is this guy doing? Like, <laughs> like people from my hometown or people who've known me for a couple of years are like, wait, what are you doing? This is crazy, dude. This is so funny. Like, I can't believe you're doing this. So that got a lot of engagement because people were like sharing and liking and all that stuff. Um now not as much but it's still pretty decent like i think every reel gets around like 500 views which i mean hey i need to be better with like my insights and really like i guess you could say pushing that to push more engagement and page growth but that's something that i think now that i've found the flow of like i've established the habit because my goal was like three reels a week or three posts a week now that that's feeling a bit more easy and manageable i'm going to start diving into getting a bit more engagement and tracking those metrics. I'll probably reach out for some help, I think, because it is, I don't know, it's a domain I know nothing about. Yeah. I, I moved in. I didn't have an Instagram account, I don't think, until COVID times. Uh, I was like, nah, I'm Facebook. But I'm as a generation of like, you know, where everybody my age was on Facebook and that's all. And no one used Instagram. But then I started, I, yeah. I'm hardly on Facebook at all anymore. And I just use Instagram. Well, I shouldn't say just, but I, I use it primarily and and I find it's way better for engagement and for getting your your stuff out there like I get more uh sales and more um shares and likes and all that stuff on Instagram than I do on on other platforms have you thought about the TikTok or no uh yeah but no yeah I thought about it but no it's just there's one no, more thing to manage no, no, yeah. more thing to do uh, I, a lot of people are like, oh, if you yeah. want to get you want to get out there, get your name out there, get your face out there, you got to go to TikTok. And I, I'm like, yeah, but it's just there's there's only so many hours in the day. And unless I hired a social yeah. media manager, which I then I'll be forced to put out tons of content. And I don't know, you know, what it's like it's sometimes yeah. it's, it's, it's a grind sometimes when you're th trying to think, OK, what am I going to oh. put? I should put something out there, you know, and then you just. Some of you put stuff out there yeah. and it's great. And sometimes you you put something out there you just didn't even think about and it gets like, you know, 2,000 views. And another time you you put all this time and energy into yeah. it and you get 12. And you're like, I don't understand. Like they're, they're, the yeah. science and the randomness yeah. of it is is really difficult. The one thing that has, I've, I've had a couple calls with people that I, I guess you could say are who would be good people to give me guidance in the social media, like growth space. And a lot of them do just say that TikTok is quite valuable for the algorithm. Like it's more predictable in terms of like that video did well for X, Y, and Z. Now let's like recreate that content where Instagram's algorithm is a bit different in that way. It's not as, I guess you could say good in, in simple terms. So it can be a bit more, indecisive on like the feedback it's like well why did that do well like that kind of actually doesn't seem to make sense like in my opinion it seems like a poor quality video where the content was kind of just like hey i needed to get something out so i put that together really quick whereas apparently tiktok gives you a lot more of the specifics like that did well this is why and then what a lot of people have told me is use tiktok as kind of your like test subject field and then you use the good stuff on Instagram, but like you said, another thing to do, another thing to manage, which sounds like an absolute headache right now. Like, <laughs> yeah. Some people, some people love it. Some people have the energy for it. Not me. Not me. Yeah. One of the well, actually, I think my second yeah. most popular video I ever had on Instagram was one, was uh, one where I was like telling everybody I was like uh, suffering from shingles, uh, <laughs> which was the most random video <laughs> at like 900 views of it or something. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> people love watching others suffer they're like yeah, oh, i was just in ag i was just in agony and i was like i don't know let's just tell people let's just talk about it and then uh, uh, you know the amount of messages and stuff i got was uh, like oh this is funny so people want to see me suffer okay that's good to know did, wait did people reach out to like just learn more about it or were they just kind of hey i hope you're doing well like what was uh, that engagement like that's a bit that is odd though actually what I find often with, with with the stuff I put out there is you will get some people comment, but I will 
if it's a popular thing like that, I get so many DMs from people that are like, you know, they'll ask questions like clinical questions about like, oh, well, if someone comes in to oh. see me, you know, what can you do? And I'm like, don't touch them because they don't even want like just stay away yeah. from me. <laughs> you know, I had a few of those. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, oh, aren't you contagious? I'm like, well, no, because it's like the chicken pox virus. It's like living in my spinal nerves. Like a lot of people just didn't know what it was. And so I had a lot yeah. of questions about, about that kind of stuff. So anyway, it's just, it's interesting. It's funny how those oh. things all work. But yeah. Um, hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, I'd like you to, 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 to tell us a little bit about, um, just some of the content you have on there. Like there's a lot of it is myth busting, right? And I've done a, a series of episodes where people have talked about myth busting. And I think it's always, uh, personally, it's, I, I feel it's an important thing for us to call out the BS, uh, because, you know, people deserve to have higher value care. That's not based on falsehoods. So tell us a little bit about some of the, some of the things you put out there and why you've chosen certain topics. Okay. So I think one of the, like one of the overarching themes is people have limited time and a lot of people want to better their health and wellness. And so with that space being so controversial and so much misinformation also out there, it's like, how can people get the best results for the best bang for their buck? And so when I'm thinking about creating a video, I'm kind of like, okay, what's a common theme that people are like, oh, like the stretching week of the stretching theme of this week, everything's sort of been built around like, hey, you're doing a 30 minute stretching warm up to like prevent injury. Like that's your intention, which is great, but you're probably just wasting 30 minutes. And if you're short on time and you're like trying to get a workout in, like just get sweaty for five and then start your workout and just build up to that. So it, I'd say most of my content is built around the, like, how can we get you the results the most efficiently? Um, and yeah, stop spending time in areas that aren't paying dividends and won't pay dividends. That's kind of like what I like to think about when I'm going to try and get a message across. And aside from that, it's, I'd say a lot of like what clients tell me or ask questions about and what their assumptions are, or what they're told previously from a different healthcare provider, that stuff's always comedic. Cause you're just kind of like shit, like a doctor told you that like, <laughs> now I got to compete with this guy who's got like 12 years of school and well, that's tough, but I mean, Hey, like I'm taking facts from people who have like 30 years of education and research. So I'm just the middleman. Like, don't freak out at me. Yeah. Don't shoot the messenger. Yeah. Yeah. Don't shoot the messenger. But I'd say, yeah, though, like another overarching theme would be I really want people to feel better. And a lot of people just feel better when they move. And that regarding mental health also. So I think that's one of the aspects from like my previous like training, strength, conditioning stuff that I always kind of try and bring in. It's like, what's the minimum therapeutic dose that you can do to like feel better or lose body fat to in a, in a healthy manner? Like we don't, I, I also, I'm not really trying to niche down to like, hey, you want to have a six pack? It's more like, hey, why don't we get you moving? Because you'll feel good. And if you give a shit about that, I'm sure at some point your body composition will change, but like who don't even think about that. Like who really cares right now? We're just trying to get you feeling better and being more capable in your life. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think it's great. And so are you, the, the people that you're, that you're going at or uh, clientele or people you're trying to educate, you said it's mostly uh, the, like the public rather than other RMTs. Is that right? Yeah, definitely more the public than other RMTs. I just kind of think that if we, if I can kind of help educate the mass, the masses, if the platform grows, they'll be able to maybe identify more bullshit than trying to change other people's minds as the practitioners who, yeah, are more, are, are more caught in their self biases of, oh, I do this and I help people or you know, their own beliefs and opinions where I think the public is a bit, well, they are a bit more malleable, if I'm honest. That's what I kind of get from them. And if something speaks to them, they kind of lock onto that. And I think that's where 
I'm trying to just be like, hey, this is simple and it's not complicated. And it also makes sense. Like you could show this to your five-year-old, maybe bleep the fuck, but your five-year-old would probably be like, oh, like, oh, that does make sense, mommy. And and that'd be kind of the end of that. And it's like, if your five-year-old can understand this versus, hey, I'm aligning all these things and all these subluxations and stuff like that, which would just be kind of like, what the hell? Then I think they'll kind of really catch on. I agree with you. I think it's a great idea to to educate the the public because, um, and there's some there's some great research out there that looks at you know um, if the public was more educated about things like pain and, and disability and whatnot, uh, then it, the the general idea is that it would reduce healthcare usage. Oh no doubt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, which goes along with with your line of thinking too, right? Like if if someone goes in to see somebody because they've got back pain, and the public knows, like, yeah, I got back pain, but you know, whatever. I'm not worried that I've herniated a disc. I'm not worried that like it's I'm out of alignment or whatever. I just need someone to, you know, give me some exercises or give me some massage, something to help it feel better. Then they're not going to go in there and, and and show up, and they're going to be able to call out when someone's like, you need to see me three times a week for the next six years. Uh, and it's yeah. going to cost, and you can prepay now and it's going to cost you $300,000, <laughs> whatever, you know, like these, <laughs> yeah, you know, that line is always crazy. <laughs> Red flag number one. Yeah. Oh. So it, I think it, with the, if the public has a better understanding, um, then yeah, they, they probably be like, mm, that doesn't make sense. I, that that's not what I've heard before. Um, but you are right. It is hard to mm-hmm. change therapist minds because so much of us are, are stuck in our own biases and we have our own. Uh, everybody's got them, but uh, yeah, totally. I've, I've been at the education stuff for a lot of years now, and I still, I'm always amazed when it, how many people in every course I teach that they, there's some of the things I talk about, they've never heard of before. And that always blows what my mind. What do you away. find in your courses? Like, what do you find in your, your courses are the percentage of people if there are any that are you're when they kind of they finish or they're done you kind of do a bit of a check-in you're like ah they're like they're just they're sticking with their ways and that's that um it depends i would say over time so as like all of us hopefully we get better and less shitty at the things we do the more we do it i would say early in my days teaching I, Mm -hmm. i i would say you know it was probably I would say probably I made a difference for 25% of people positive and 75% of the people I probably just pushed away further because I was not very good at communicating my, my content. I would say now, I mean, still trying to get better. The amount of people that don't change, I would, or let me say this. I would say it's very rare that somebody admits that they won't change, that they, that they're they're, they're happy in their way. That's a good point. Uh, but I would say that probably you're probably about 25% of people would, I would imagine would go away and just not take anything from the course. Cause they're just like, Nope, it's too challenging. Um, but I've really changed my messaging yeah. a ton in the last few years to try and make it less threatening and more all encompassing rather than me, like rather than yeah, just yeah. spending so much time busting myths and calling shit out. It's more about like looking at the similarities of what we all do and trying to, bring that all together under like a common narrative and common understanding. Cause if I'm going to tell somebody yeah. like cranial sacral doesn't do what you think it does, it's garbage there. And they, that's yeah. how they've been practicing for 20 years. There's no way they're going to listen. They're, 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 they're going to shut down yeah. everything I say. But if I say you do that approach and obviously it's working for people because you have a full practice for 20 years, what are some of the things that can explain why that works based on things we've talked about? And then they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll kind of bring in some of the things about like, Oh, the contextual effects and the, 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 the feel good touch in a meaningful um, manner. And, you know, the other, like the, the, the therapeutic kind of environment that they're, they're in and, and they can kind of bring that all together. And so I'm like, but your touch isn't doing what you think it's doing, but it doesn't mean it's not helping this person. And so kind of flipping that script to being like, can you just change a little bit, maybe how you're communicating this? If, when it, if the person wants to know, Mm -hmm. don't make up a story. Uh, I found that is a lot, uh, way, way better engagement. And, uh, I don't, I no longer get, uh, threatens, uh, threatening messages after courses. Well, I just say never rarely. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I guess initially it was like their backs were up against the wall and they, they just felt, yeah, they just felt attacked. Always, always, right? All the time. Yeah. And it, was, it was like that. And, and, you know, I've had a few occasions in the last couple of years when I ventured uh, the further East I ventured, I've had more uh, pushback, but I think it's just, hmm. I think the, the, the messaging and, and just kind of the general um, uh, information that's out there in, in BC and it's kind of spreading to Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, you know, Ontario, it's kind of things that information is getting out there. Uh, but you know, I, I, if it's hard to fault anybody, I mean, I'd like to blame people for not, for being lazy and for not paying attention, but I, to be honest, if you live in a small town in you know, on the Atlantic coast and you don't have social media and you're like one of only two therapists in your little town and you don't, you don't go on the internet very much other than to maybe email your friends or your family, you know, uh, are you going to be that engaged and trying to keep up with all the latest stuff? Probably not. Because it probably doesn't yeah. matter to you. And so sometimes I, yeah, I, totally. I have to get myself out of my like ego of thinking that like every massage therapist needs to know all this stuff. Otherwise they're going to destroy the world. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 So anyway. Uh, yeah, I can't remember what the initial question was, but anyway, there's the answer after. <laughs> <laughs> no, we that was perfect. That was yeah, perfect. That was perfect. Um, so yeah, so one thing I was gonna I, I wanted to ask you because, like, you know, a lot of the content you put out there is kind of challenging some of the status quo. What's it like with your colleagues? Like, are, are most of your RMT colleagues like? Are you guys all pretty much on the same page with you know the pain science, the evidence based stuff? I would say no not all of them. The one thing that I always kind of find interesting, and I'm sure you can speak to this, almost similar to that last question of how many people kind of take what you say and then completely use it all encompassing, is the aspect of how people kind of still pick and choose what they want to identify with in terms of I'd say like the pain science and what they're kind of like I'm still going to stick with my ways when I just for when people are kind of speaking like that in terms of oh, okay maybe they're like yeah I'm not getting rid of adhesions but they still kind of maybe give the craniosacral spiel of like hey that's what I'm doing here I always find that interesting so I'm like I'm just going to let them be and I hope as things progress they'll you know keep climbing that ladder um, I mean, the other side of this, I, I'm very, like, I'm very interested in business. I have a big passion for business and sort of like an entrepreneurial sort of journey that I, I want to continue pursuing. And the other side of it is, to me, it's almost, it, it's quite, makes me quite curious because I'm like, I feel like some people, they don't necessarily even believe what they're saying, but they are speaking to their audience and their like product positioning is like, hey, I, this is who I am. This is what I do. And that's just the way they almost market. And I don't know if that's worse or what, because in one sense, I'm like, I speak like when I used to work at a bigger clinic, I was like, man, like I, I speak to these people every day. Like they seem quite intelligent. Like they must kind of know what's going on. They might, they must have some skepticism because in the back office, we talk about other things in life where it's like, oh, okay. Like, you know, you're not a complete kook. Like, you know, you, you kind of got some stuff in your head here, but then the way they still communicate with clients about certain things and what they're doing it's like way down that, that rabbit hole. And I'm just like, that doesn't add up to me. So I find those people the toughest. Cause yeah, there's some people that are just crazy and I'm like, all right, you're crazy. That's cool. Like I respect that you do you, but the people who are, I think more knowledgeable than they lead on or what they communicate to clients that's where I just have a tough time almost even approaching them because I don't really know what to say. Cause I don't want to be like, Hey, I think you're smarter than that. 
and why are you playing dumb? Because I feel like that could be taken quite negatively, of course, which is fair. But the other side of that, like I was saying in the beginning, was, you know, how much of this is that business aspect, that marketing aspect, and, hey, I'm I'm playing a role or this is my persona in this space and and people seek out what they feel comfortable with or where they identify and so like i mean we could put that in science terms as like the therapeutic alliance and like hey i like people who speak my language so i'm going to see this person i really wish they would just kind of come around a bit more with what you were saying and how they do explain things i think that would be a lot more valuable it's like, hey, yeah, this is the context that I kind of like provide therapy under, but this is just more so because you understand the language and we can speak together in a way that makes sense to you and makes sense to me. But hey, I'm not realigning your chakras like I'm saying every day. It's more just like, yeah, this is making you feel good and yada, yada, yada. So it's always a tough subject to to really breach with with other people because yeah it's it's always interesting on how they take it and sometimes it's funny i'm sure as you've experienced the oh whoa wait really and then you're kind of like oh you were just waiting for someone to maybe give you a bit of a green light to be skeptical and then they're like oh wait this isn't like I kind of always wonder, but I didn't know what to do and I didn't know what to say. And it's like, oh shit, you're on board. Like fucking read this, read this, like watch a couple of these YouTube videos. And then like two weeks later, like, fuck, like, I'm so <laughs> glad you gave me that. Cause those people, they kind of, I think they reach a point of disinterest and sort of, they just, they don't, they don't have any passion anymore because they, they don't believe in what they're doing. And I mean, to relate this again to sort of the business side of things like sales, a massive part of sales is speaking with conviction. And if these people are trying to build a therapeutic alliance and help someone and they're speaking with this, like, uh, you know, it's, I think we're making you feel good. Like the people on the other end of that, on the other side of that room, another chair is going to be like, this person doesn't even believe a word they're fucking saying. Like, I'm not going to get any help here. Um, and it's not their fault. They just don't know. So yeah, it's always interesting. It's so easy to market certainty, though, and that's why there's such a uh, it's so attractive to have mm -hmm. those, those those stories where you're you're fixing or you're releasing or you're balancing or whatever it is you might you might work under it because it 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 brings people back because it gives them something tangible to hang on. Yeah, to. Uh, and it's true. Like the yeah, when totally. you look at the evidence, the evidence suggests that you know, when we're dealing with pain, there is no certainty. It's so uncertain. And so oftentimes, if you want to be mm. honest and ethical and you speak to a client and you say, yeah, you know what, we we can help you feel better. Maybe we can't really figure out why you hurt, but we I believe that you hurt. Let's try some touch and some movement and let's try and do a few things here to see if we can make you feel better. But I'm, I've ruled out any red flags, so I'm pretty sure, you know, uh, you're just in pain. And that's like, oh, you mean I just hurt? Yeah. And we don't really know why? Like, oh, OK. Like, it can be really uncertain. That can make people feel um, I think if delivered in a way where if you aren't convinced, like you said, if you're not convinced in what you believe and you don't communicate that well to the person, then they're not going to buy in. And and that's the key. Yeah. I think that the, the difficult thing with being like, say, you know, air quotes, evidence based is that we can't give solid answers because we don't have them. But we have to let people know that it's okay yeah. to be uncertain. And totally. that's. And that's not nearly um, as sexy and as exciting as being like, come in for these number of visits. I'm going to realign your your fascial system, and then you're going to be good to go. People can buy; they can grab onto that. Yeah. One of the things that I've actually now started doing to to place a little more conviction in kind of the the therapeutic process is saying something along the lines of like, okay, this is what we're going to try. This works for people. We're going to see how it makes you feel. And then I place a bit of that like positive placebo. Like, I think it's going to make you feel better. So let's try this with some conviction, like whatever that, you know, therapy or home care is. And it's like, we're going to do this. I think it's going to help. 
And then they come back and they're either like, oh, that helped. That's awesome. That's what I needed to get fixed. And I'm like, who knows, but it's helping. So who gives a fuck? So like, let's just keep doing that. And we'll just scale that in whatever area that is and whatever it's helping you. So maybe it's like graded exposure with resistance. It's like, oh, that's helping me a lot. It's like, great. Well, that's helping you. So who care, who cares about anything else? Like, let's just keep hammering that until it doesn't work. And then the other side of that is when they come back and they're like, yeah, that wasn't it. Like that didn't help me at all. Or it made me feel worse. I'm like, oh, normal. Some people don't like that. I think this what is what might help you. Let's try this. Because then they start to catch on with the like, it's not a one fix for everyone approach. And and they, they usually people realize they can find another area in their life where that makes a lot of sense and they can kind of find common ground there. And they're like, oh yeah, like that works for Kathy and James in like this area or this domain of their life, but it didn't work for me and I had to try other things. And it's like, yeah, same thing. Like we just got to find what works for you, but something will start making you feel a bit better. And when we find that, that's when we just keep hammering that tree because until it stops making stops giving you that progression and then i find like i can speak with more conviction and they can have more of a trust in their relationship with me because initially it was sort of like uh yeah we'll try all these things and you know there is really no answer because we don't know and hopefully one of these things sticks and it's more just like no, I'll see you again in two weeks. It worked, didn't work, great. Like reassess and like, let's just keep going. And then they also don't feel, I think people then also, they don't feel as as much on the like, hey, you're trying to sell me. Because if someone has like, I would say a bit of skepticism or education in general, they appreciate the like, oh, I don't really know, but we're going to figure it out and we'll keep trying. Like they're like, oh, that's, that's like a real person. Cool. Let's keep going. I trust this person now versus the like, okay, it's not working. It's making me feel worse. It's like, no, you just haven't done it enough. Like keep doing it. It's like, well, I don't want to keep doing it. It's like, no, no, no. You just got to keep doing it. And then they're just like, what the fuck's that about? Like, this <laughs> is fun. So, yeah. It, it's, it goes, I mean, like what you said there too goes in, uh, uh, it's consistent with a large body of evidence too, right? Which suggests that, you know, treatments that are performed in a positive context tend to perform better when we're dealing with like MSK pain. So, you know, we're not lying to people, mm. but if you're like, yeah, like that's where your clinical experience is so important. Right. You say, well, I've people with, I've, I've seen people like this before with like yourself and, you know, we've tried these things and they tend to work pretty well. So let's just go, let's, let's try this a few times and, and see, see how this works and see how this progresses. And yeah. And if people, if people believe you and if they, are, if they like you and they, they do the things that you, you, you guys work on together, then, they're, they're probably going to feel better more often than not. Yeah, totally. No, totally. Yeah. Well, you've, uh, one thing that you talked about, you mentioned earlier, uh, was this kind of goes with all this stuff we're talking about was you talked about your, you, you really interested in like this kind of, uh, entrepreneurial ambitions. Uh, you've, you're really keen on, on that. Tell, tell me a little bit more about, about that. Cause I know last or last time we spoke on zoom of, I don't know when that was six months, a year ago, you were looking about buying a clinic and I yeah. it was like, that's the stupidest thing you could do. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Heck tell me, yeah. tell me, tell me more. Oh, about you're going to get me too juiced up though. I love, love this kind of stuff. So yeah, I mean a different, a different area, I guess, of conversation, but I, I've just started to really, enjoy business and I like the multifaceted aspect of it and how it's yeah there's so much involved in in like hey marketing sales like building a team and I I don't know something about that really speaks to me and so I have like a business mentor he's actually like one of my really good friends and he's kind of always pushed me to be like hey man I think I mean not me because I don't know. Everyone's got a lot of self doubt, but he's like, Hey, like you're good in certain areas. Like, I think you should kind of put more time into here. And when I was younger, he kind of was, you know, under the wing and like, Hey, read this, do this. Like you're progressing. And I'd say maybe about a year ago, two years ago, kind of almost a bit before we spoke about the clinic thing, I was like, Oh, I really like this idea of building a business and, and 
not so much going down the like I want to be an employee like I really want that journey of I'm going to learn a bunch in so many different areas and that's what's like really stimulating to me I really I enjoy hard work but I also like learning a lot I need to be sort of stimulated in that way and that entrepreneurial kind of thing of building a business is something that really speaks to me as long as I can provide value to a bunch of people and help them in a certain way. And one of the, one of the mindsets that I'm really in right now is it's just like, you just got to reiterate and reiterate and learn more and more and more. And there's so many people in that entrepreneurial space who are like now massively successful, but they started way out in left field. And you'd be like, how the hell did you get from there? to hear and it's like well they just one persistence like you just persistence and you just continue chipping away but you're not really gonna know and so there's this like massive lack of i would say security in a sense but you really just have to trust the process and that's kind of something that i'm just on board with right now and i think it's, it's a really good time in my life and the past year was a bit of a lot of conversing with people that I trust quite a bit and like, Hey, like, should I take this road? Because I want what it could potentially give me in terms of freedom and flexibility and enjoyment and sort of fitting my work to passions, but it's not very secure. It's terrifying. And also like, who the fuck am I to think I'm going to be you know, the next whoever in air quotes. And and that's not really like the goal. It's more just, I want the, I want that experience in my life. Um, and so the clinic thing was the first kind of idea because it was like, hey, this is my niche. Like I should explore the idea of, of, of being a clinic operator and then expanding and expanding and having clinics and building this like clinic healthcare brand. And it was interesting because I was at the at a pool in Brentwood Bay, the resort, with that mentor guy. And he was like, hey, why don't you do that? And let's crunch the numbers right here. So we kind of crunched the numbers. And I was crunching the numbers of things I kind of knew and had heard about the clinic that I used to work at. And I was kind of like, these numbers are a bit iffy. Like, this is, I don't know how good this really is. So then... I was kind of like on his side because he runs a massive company, he's a CEO of a startup and he's done quite well. And so his like humble ego was like, well, what I think is there's people in this space who start as healthcare providers and then they just become business owners without any previous knowledge. And they're engulfed in this world of, wow, there's a bunch of stuff that I had no idea about. So they're undereducated in that domain. So it's really challenging for them to figure things out when they start out and there's a lot more to it than they know and they have to learn while they're building but then they're so worried about just staying afloat that maybe that's he's kind of like I think that might be the reason why it seems so challenging and I, that kind of did speak to me a bit and I was like yeah that makes sense because if I just started building a clinic right now I'd have no fucking idea about like you tell me what profit margin was back then and I'd kind of be like okay Sounds good. I should probably Google what profit margin is. <laughs> and I'm like, there's no way other people in the space aren't, are just like, oh yeah, profit margin, like revenue, like fixed overhead versus like liquidity and stuff like that. Like they, I'm like, oh, they got to be the same as me. So I was like, hey, I'm going to reach out to some clinic owners. And so you were one of them. And I ended up reaching out to like, probably, I'd almost say eight to 10 in total. And the everyone said the exact same thing as you pretty much. It was like, there isn't as much profit as people think. It's a lot more work than people think. And you're always still kind of working in the business and on it. So your hours are doubled. And it was interesting because when I heard that from that many people also with like have had like who have had a clinic for everyone that I spoke to kind of had had a clinic for at least five years. I was like, okay, this can't just be down to the healthcare provider anymore. Like after five years, they have acquired some business acumen. They have spoken to people who have business knowledge and like sought out resources or help from people who 
know that area and they're still having these problems in a sense like maybe it's the market and not the person anymore and so then I did more digging and sort of more just research and was like wow this isn't I don't think this is the space to kind of explore this entrepreneurial thing in anymore and that's kind of where I ended and now I'm exploring a couple other opportunities and and sort of journeys but yeah unfortunately that wasn't it wasn't what I thought it was and I don't think it's what a lot of people assume. You're 100% right. And I'm glad you decided to listen to everyone's advice that it's, you know, if you create, if you create a clinic, or if you want to be a <laughs> clinic owner, right, what you're basically doing is you're creating a place to work, you're creating a job. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, there is there is clinic owners out there that, that make money. But usually they are large, large, large clinics, and they have like management teams, and they've got you know, a lot of other people doing it, but the majority of the clinics are, are of a certain size. Like they're small where it's usually a, a single owner operator. Uh, maybe there's two, like, like mm -hmm. for me, I, I had a business mm -hmm. partner and you're, you're, you're both working in the business as well as you're working on the business. And even if you hire, mm -hmm. you know, office managers and some admin team and you try and, you know, um, uh, basically pay others to do all the stuff you don't want to do. It all eats into your profit. So you have to, you're like, okay, well, how much totally. working clinically, there's, you only, there's only so much money you can work because it's not scalable. Right. Mm -hmm. And a no, business, it's not like, scalable. And that, that was the whole issue. It was like, well, that was the whole issue. It was like, it, it really wasn't scalable. Like it, it just, it just wasn't. And sure. It was like, okay, I can go like massive enterprise scalable, but do I really want to spend 15 years to like to, to get to a place where I'm no longer a part of the business, working in the business or on the business? And now I'm just an owner with a cash flow producing asset. It's like, no, I do not want to spend 15 years doing that. Like I could find another area of business and get to that place in five. I mean, hey, that's obviously not guaranteed, but it's just like, why would I put myself in that? that in that journey or position of, Hey, you're signing up for like 15 years to maybe get to this place where why not try three other things four or five years. And one of them will hit in a lot more higher likelihood. So it's just like, that didn't make sense to me. No, that's brilliant, Carlos. And that's, that's so true. Uh, every, every clinic owner I've ever talked to, they don't really make a lot of money. Um, like the clinic doesn't make a lot of money because like you said, it's not scalable. So even if you aren't working in the clinic, and you've got all your rooms filled, you know, seven days a week, you know, the, the reality is, is, is uh, your overhead and your cost, your business is ridiculous. At least in Victoria, where we are, it's really expensive. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, your wages are expensive and those are just going up and up and up for like your, your office and admin staff. But then the thing is too, is that, you know, the therapists uh, have a certain standard that, that they're like, I, you can't charge me that amount of rent because I could go somewhere else and pay less. So the market of our profession actually stops uh, RMT clinics from, from making a lot of money. You would need to have totally a lot of physios, a lot of chiros or a lot of other people or kinesis that are in there where you could, they could see more people and you could charge them a higher percentage. It just, the numbers just don't work very well for most places. It's just the way it is. Yeah. And, and I mean, this in the most like respectable way too. And I, I mean, I can say this cause I'm also an RMT, but man, RMTs fucking suck to employ. Like I would not, like that was the other thing. I was like, man, all these RMTs are absolute headaches. Like we're all just drama. Like we want vacay. We want to give you less money as a clinic owner and then make more and work whenever we want and not work whenever we want. And, and then we want more hours this week and none the next week. I'm like, we're all just absolute headaches to deal with like i don't want to deal with these people like no thank you yeah it's like no i'm not a clinic owner anymore so i guess i could say in my experience yes rmts were usually the ones that i mean that's my audience but rmts were usually the ones that were the hardest to uh to deal with in terms of you know uh hours days they wanted to work uh rental agreements yeah. uh way way more difficult um, but I'm, I, you know, like you said, the, the entrepreneurial journey, right? I, I had these ambitions. I'm glad I did it. I mean, I owned that clinic for 12 years and, um, I sold my shares, uh, last year and the clinic still exists, but I'm not there. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm way happier now doing like the entrepreneurial stuff I'm doing now with the teaching and the online stuff. And 
all the other work and things I do, um, podcast is so satisfying. And what's great too, is that yeah, I only answer to me and I do have one, um, a one assistant that I pay a part-time assistant that does some of the, you know, behind the scenes stuff for me. It's so much nicer that the freedom of, of being an entrepreneur, uh, right now, particularly with internet and technology, like you, like for you, right. With the stuff you're doing, you, you probably don't, you don't need to be in an office necessarily all the time. Right. If you're doing yeah. your coach, your coaching no, and wellness stuff, not. right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not. And like that, I mean, it's just, that was the other thing too, what kind of made me, I mean, we could relate to something else in terms of like, imagine going to medical school in the fifties and it's like, Hey, I need an answer. Okay. Go to the library and try and find the textbook and then try and find the chapter and then try and find the page. But like, we're in this technological era, like it's the perfect time to try and build a business. And it doesn't really matter what business, like you have every resource imaginable. Like it's incredible. It's actually just crazy. Like, why would you not want to give a certain amount of time to being an entrepreneur when you have chat GPT to literally just answer, Hey, like, how do I market for X product? And it's like, boom. And you're like, great. Now, how do I spin this to more of my like target audience? And it's just like, it's insane. Like it's the perfect time. And especially for, I mean, I'm young, I'm, I'm 26. So it's, I have no dependence. It's like, what else am I going to do? I might as well. You're a baby. 26. Yeah. (laughs) Baby. Yeah. Yeah. I'm almost 20. I'm almost 20 years older than you. So, uh, that's funny. The, but yeah, you're still a spring chicken too. Like no one's old till they're like 65 at least. Oh, well, I got 20 years then. I just turned 45. <laughs> uh, know mm-hmm. I know I, what, what I, I read somewhere. And so this is one of those, this is a totally non-evidence based statement, but I did read somewhere that there's more millionaires now, like within the last, I think within the last 10 years from online, like people running online businesses than there is in any other industry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's true, but it kind of yeah makes sense when you look at what's out there and how much money people are making in these weird little niche markets. And I know some of the online business groups I'm with, like there's people I'm like, what you make money on that? And they're like, oh yeah, I'm making like fifty thousand yeah. dollars a month. I'm thinking, holy crap, you know? Yeah. Which which is which is crazy. The one thing that I've actually found quite interesting, and maybe this will speak to you. Um, is right now there's so much push. There's, there's so many like personal brands being created. So like they build the business around themselves. Right. And initially when I was starting the content, I was going to kind of do that. And I was like, Hey, I'll build more of a personal brand. Cause I'd say you have a bit more of a personal brand too. Like it's your name yeah. and, and your coaching, but I'm sure at some point that will potentially change, but The thing with that is there's going to be a point where you don't want to maybe be so much in the business or be the face of the business. And you want to take more time away from the business with family or friends or, hey, whatever, more flexibility. And so that was the interesting thing that when I was talking with my guy, Jason, he was like, we could do that. And it might help you in the beginning a bit faster because you could sell yourself a bit better versus trying to build a bit of a brand. But he's like, at some point you could hire an operator to then run the business. Like if we sit, take the coaching business and then sure, you'd have to pay them and you could find a good operator operator and compensate them really well. But like in the grand scheme of things, let's say, you're doing it by yourself and you're profiting like 50 K a month. Like, that's great. Cool. You're profiting 50 K a month. What's, what would you rather have profit 50 K a month and work like 40 hours a week or profit 30 K a month and work eight hours a week. And I was like, shit, like 30 K is more than enough money than I need. I'll still help my mom and dad. And like, I'll live lavishly because I'm not a materialistic guy, but you're telling me I'd work eight hours a week. Like, I'm going to Thailand and then Bali, like that's, that's what's up. And so I'm, I'm curious to kind of see what'll happen in like 10 years in the entrepreneurial space and the business space with like, are people still going to be building personal brands or at some point where there'll be more of a shift again, back to building 
these like brand empires so people can then again transition oh and i mean like it's not the hardest thing to just like switch your trajectory and be like okay you know the brand name is still you but now you're not the one as doing much fulfillment but it's it's going to be interesting to me to see like if that does start to switch back because the social media marketing the technological age of business is quite new and so in 10 20 years once these people have done so well, they're going to want to cash out in a sense. So what are they going to do and how are they going to cash out? The personal brand is what I've seen is, yeah, you, you, you do have the face of the brand is usually someone's name, like for myself, um, you know, my, I'm a personal brand for sure. Uh, but the, mm. and I think, I think you're, you're, I would agree with what your guy, your business mentor said is that, yeah, like it's good to set you up for success because people know who you are. Right, and you're associated with this 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 brand or this image, uh, and then, but some of the people I've seen that have gone really successful, they keep they keep that. Like it's still their it's still their their name, but they're not doing hardly mm -hmm. any of the work. They're kind of the face of the business, but the yeah. people doing all the fulfillment, yeah. all the sales, everything is all like a team around it. And uh, and I, I yeah. the people I know that have done that have been very very successful doing that because. They're selling their brand, but they're not, they're like, they're like, they're doing the eight hour, 10 hour week kind of thing. Some weeks more, some yeah. weeks. Yeah. And that's definitely the, that's definitely the play. I think once people get to that position where like, wow, I'm doing so much. And then they kind of realize I can outsource a lot of this work. Then it's kind of, then it does become irrelevant. It's like, Hey, just find good people to do the fulfillment and you can do whatever you want. But that does come with, I think for a lot of people in the beginning, quite intimidating to be like, Hey, like I'm no longer going to do the sales calls. Like I'm the best at sales calls. Like that's just my ego. Like I got to do the sales calls. No one can sell like me because it's my product. And it's like, yeah, but you give someone two months and you also hire someone who has done sales for a 10, 20 year career. They're probably going to be just better at you, better than you. So like, that's fine. That's the biggest problem that I I see in here when I talk to other, you know, uh, whether it's course creators or, you know, um, RMTs that are personal brands or other people in, in other industries that are personal brands is that there, there's that point of like, and I, I was, I, I mean, I'm guilty of this too. It's happened to me is, is like, when do I start paying for things to buy time so I can build the business, right? It's a fine line. You're like, well, I don't have enough money right now. I can't pay for this person to do this thing for me over here. But if I pay for this person to do this thing over for me over here, that's going to give me more time to focus on this aspect of the business, which I'm good at, which is maybe it's your marketing or your content creation. So it's like, when do you make those decisions? And and that's the hardest part for people is like, when do I pull the trigger? And when do I when do I take that? Lead? I have the answer. What's the answer? So the answer is read the book called Buy Back Your Time. It literally answers that perfectly. Have you read it? Do you know it? I've heard of it. I haven't read it. I got a behind me here. I and mean, People can't say I got a whole shelf full of business books. I've read most of them. That one's not on it, but uh, I'm happy to read it. I'm going to write it down. So that it's great because one of the things that actually even gives you is a formula for how much you should spend on outsourcing certain tasks. And so what it is, it's like you take your revenue. I can't remember the exact equation, but you take your revenue, you divide it by something, I don't know, multiply it by nominal, whatever. And it's like, based off your revenue, if you can find someone to do X work for $12 on Upwork, you should pay that because your time is more valuable on skills that other people can't fulfill yet and you will get more growth because you can spend more time in the areas that do require you to spend the time even if that's just ideating and thinking like okay what is the next step in this business like what is my vision where am i going because sure in the beginning we do need to be frugal but if you can start outsourcing stuff just for you to sit an hour a day and be like, okay, this is good. This is good. This is good. What's next. Like you have to have that time. If you don't, you won't think of what's next and then you just won't even grow. 
So, I mean, as you know, it's, it's just the investment that comes with building a business. Yeah. And that's a huge thing. And, and yeah, the, the advice I was given um, from a business colleague was you should outsource whenever you're questioning, if you should outsource, if you're asking yourself, should I outsource this? The answer is yes. Mm. <laughs> that's good. Actually. That is good. Yeah. For one way, for one reason or another, it's like, I hate doing this shit. Should I outsource this? It's like, yeah, you hate doing this shit. Just outsource it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it's, it's funny because as time goes on, like I, you know, in the last, now that I'm, you know, I, I'm not in a, I'm not working in a clinic anymore. And, and 99% of my work stuff I do is, is, you know, RMT related, but it's more, more teaching or, you know, coaching and these kind of things. And uh, what I've found is that it's funny how you start to, you start to outsource more and more and more things. You don't realize how much you're actually like spending an overhead, basically an overhead paying things out, but it, it, you're buying your time, right? Whereas before it, it was not uncommon for mm. me to do like a 50, 60 hour work week. Like I was working ridiculous hours, right? The kids would go to bed and then it'd be up all night, yeah. you know, and then I get up early in the morning, I'd be working all day. Uh, and then you're like, this is unhealthy. Yeah. Like, and I felt terrible and I was yeah. burnt out and mental health crises and all kinds of terrible stuff. Mm. Uh, and then it wasn't until I kind of like stopped what like reevaluated things outsource certain things focused on what and got rid of stuff that wasn't providing any i'm saying I say value i'm not talking monetary value i'm talking about like personal value um as well and then you start to realize like oh okay like you can you know uh this is way healthier way of doing things but grinding and yeah. doing all this stuff anyone that's listening is don't do it for too long you have to do it for a little while i think but not for too long because yeah. the yeah. outcome is not good. yeah totally not good yeah not good dumpster fire hardcore oh, yeah. dumpster fire yeah uh, well this has been great we totally like we totally went off like on on entrepreneurial stuff this this episode would be more about uh, business than anything but that's okay i thought it was uh i really enjoyed this um, <laughs> uh i guess you know just one more question because we are kind of hitting the kind of threshold of time for as long as uh these probably should be what do you think what are your feelings? Because you, you're relatively new, um, and I've been doing a bunch of interviews with relatively new therapists. I mean, you've been out for four years, but we'll we'll put you in the new category, you know, less than five oh, years. Totally. Um, what are your thoughts about the RMT's educational system, and you know, what kind of things do you think needs to change to make it more relevant to the real world of clinical practice? Yeah, I. Based really on your experience think, only. Like a cup Yeah, a couple things. I I just think they spend way too much time in certain areas, of course. I mean, I guess that's probably everyone's response, but I think they should really spend more time educating the therapists and having them do things so they have more, I would say, like health and wellness experience so they can speak to people in a way that they can communicate kind of the journey a bit better because they've kind of been through whatever that journey like entails for them it, it's kind of like hey would you rather go to someone who specializes in weight loss who's like obese but they have some educational knowledge or like the person who was obese kind of went through that experience like got a little healthier and has the educational experience like because they can then empathize with you a bit better they know the roadblocks that you're going to hit and that you're going to experience and like they can just be like hey this is what worked for me like it is only what worked for me but like don't worry it's part of the journey you will get there so I wish the schooling was a bit more all encompassing on like, Hey, this is what makes your body feel good. Like, this is what you should do to move it. Like, why do we not have a strength and conditioning class where people actually work out? And it's not like, Hey, you need to be an Olympic weightlifter or you need to do an Ironman in a year, just like three days a week, we're all going to work out and we're going to like set some goals and you're going to learn what like feeling uncomfortable in the weight room is if it's your first time going there. So then when your client comes in and they're like, Hey, I want to feel a bit more, 
physically capable as I'm getting older, it's like, oh, well, then you could get a gym membership and I could help you with some programming there. And it's like, oh, but I don't want to go to the gym. Like, people are going to look at me. It's like, oh, no, I know how you feel. Like, I was super nervous when I went. And and that that just applies to all the other domains of of like, hey, someone who's experienced chronic pain and and stuff like that. It's just I think we should be educating people more on the experiences of the clients that they're going to see so they can then help them a bit better in that way and meet them where they are and understand that they're not just going to like flip a switch and start doing their home care tomorrow with the six exercises you provided. Like that's just rarely, if ever going to happen. Um, I still really think that a lot of the educational value of some of the classes that I think some people would say they should get rid of like gen path. Like, I think that's still very valuable because you can speak to clients about things that other healthcare professionals speak to them about and don't have the length of time. Like that's a big one. People will come in and say like, Oh, I got my x-ray. This is what it said. And they kind of just said, you're okay, but I read it and it has all these big words. I have no idea what they mean. And I Google it and it tells me bad shit. And it's like, yeah, well, let's talk about that. You're going to be okay, Kathy. Like this stuff's normal. So I think like that's very important, but, but some of the other stuff, even like, I think like orthopedic testing could just be practically dumbed down to three weeks because the validity of a lot of those tests, especially if someone's already in a sensitized kind of, they're already having a sensitized experience with shoulder flexion and we're going to get them to do the empty can test. It's like, yeah, that's going to hurt every fucking time. Like, so why are we like spending hours teaching about the positioning of where the humerus is when it could just be like, Hey, put them into the position. If they contract against it and it's aggravating, then it's probably more muscular tenderness. Like, sounds good. Now, what do we do? Okay. Well, we know what to do because we spent more time on the, like, How do we communicate to them? How do we talk to them about pain? And then how do we actually like educate them on the therapy and like going through that journey of getting them to feel better with things that are in their control versus come see me, come see me, come see me. Because it's like the orthopedic tests usually don't matter at all, but we spend three months, even maybe six months, if I remember correctly, just like learning them. It's like, who cares? I don't think I've used one in like four <laughs> years. Like maybe a couple, like, I don't know, checking the ACL or something like that. But other than that, it's like, show me what hurts. Oh, that hurts. Cool. Yeah. Let's get on with it. <laughs> like, I'm not going <laughs> to just do something to make it hurt more. <laughs> like, all right. Like, oh yeah. my God, what's wrong? Why does that hurt? It's like, well, cause it already does. Yeah. <laughs> you're not, you're not, your experience is, is not yeah. unique to you, Carlos. I, every RMT I talk to, they're like, I, 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 I never do orthopedic tests. Like it's so rare. It's, it's not a common thing. Totally. Profession. Yeah. But I also think too, that, you know, there is value for them when there is value, but they're not taught when to use mm-hmm. them, not to really. It's just like, Oh, you have a shoulder problem. Here's all these tests you can do on the shoulder. And I always like to, to, yeah. I, I always make a joke in my courses. I'm like, yeah, most orthopedic tests are like the prove you're not lying test. Because yeah. it hurts when I prove flex my shoulder, lying. right? Okay, well, let's, let's like you said, you, like if it hurts, with like why would you get them to keep doing empty can and resist it, all these things, when they've already shown you that it hurts? Why would you keep mm-hmm. pro- provoking it? And yeah. if you read any of the, using the shoulders, totally. like, right? Any of the shoulder research now, almost all of it says, all, none of the tests are specific. Yeah. Very few of them are like, specific and most of them are just provocative to a movement. Well then, yeah. Why do we spend six months on in school on them? It's crazy. Yeah. The, the only thing that I would actually really love for them to add in is some sort of, and I'm sure you hear this from clients all the time. Cause I know I do, and I know other people do, but honestly, some sort of mental health education where we can speak to people in a certain framework because it is incredible how safe people start to feel and what they'll divulge in terms of things that they're going through. But 
I mean, as we know, the biopsychosocial model of pain, like psycho, like that's literally in the name. We should have some sort of education where we can, sure, we don't need to like be a therapist, but just a bit more of who knows, maybe CBT or whatever, where we can just help people along that journey. And maybe we do have specific frameworks where it's like, oh, you've had a physical trauma like altercation, like, hey, that's not our domain. Like, you should maybe see a professional, whatever. But it's related to like fear of like avoidance of a movement based off fear and stuff like that. Like, we should, I think we should be educated to be like, oh, like a bit more into the psychology of pain. And this is why you're thinking that way and feeling that way. And that's normal. And what can we do about that? Because a lot of people I know, they're quite timid even with the motivational interviewing, because it's sort of like, is that the blurred line that we should maybe be tiptoeing on? It's like, oof, like, that's crazy. Come on. Like, we're telling people, like, you bought this and we're worried about that. Like, that's absurd. That's all. And that's the fear that always comes up, right? Is that if we, if we learn about uh, psychological therapies or if we learn about, you know, psychological frameworks and then therefore we may then start to, um, psych be psychologists or try to to work outside of our scope of practice and i think that's absolutely ridiculous that's like the argument saying that when you Mm. you know if you um you know don't if you if you teach kids about drugs or or sex um you know that it's they're gonna they're gonna (laughs) then go do it right so it's best just to not talk yeah Yeah. it's like it doesn't work that way right like we know that the more education people have the better decisions they make, the better the behaviors they choose. So like not talking about psychology doesn't mean we're going to go be psychologists, but that's the, that's the argument that we hear. Right? That's the feedback we get. I'm like, yeah, but that's why would, why would you apply that thinking to us when all the other educational process uh, programs out there for changing or influencing behaviors say, you need to educate people about these things, right? You talk to kids mm-hmm. about, you know, about, you know, sex, you talk to kids about drugs, you talk to kids about alcohol, you talk to kids about, you know, prejudice and racism, you talk to kids about all these things. It doesn't mean they're all of a sudden yeah. start doing that. It's just, but like, they're aware of it. Yeah, yeah. That's, they have a healthy understanding of what this example. stuff is. Yeah, it's, it's I, the, 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 the logic for why we don't have any type of, uh, I can say behavioral science education is, is something that I could, I'm just going to shit on all the time. I could talk about that forever. Because it, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. If you're aware so, of this. I don't know. That's a disservice to the people. Yeah, it, it is a disservice to people. Because really, when you look at it, when you look at the education and, and, and what we're supposed to do, it's basically you're just like, you know, they're just meat. And you just keep them focused on the clinical presentation. But the clinical presentation of pain in their back, that's, yeah, that they're there because their back hurts. But what about if we look at the big picture of all the other things that are going on? You know, if we understood that, like, hey, this person's got a lot of crap going on in their life right now and their back hurts. Well, you know, we're mm-hmm. not going to counsel them about that, but maybe we can recognize it and say, hey, you know what? There might be an association with these things. Do you think you should go talk to somebody about it? Whatever it might be. That's good health care. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That that would be good health care. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Yeah. I could I could lose my I could go off on that stuff forever. So anyway, we should uh, probably wrap this up for us. <laughs> Um, so, uh, how can people, how can people reach you? Uh, what's the best way if you want people to, to get in contact with you? I'd say honestly, probably just through the coaching page, um, Symmetry Wellness Coaching there, you just DM me on there. There's also like a link in the bio where you can book RMT appointments if you're in Victoria. And then there's a link to the coaching page for the online coaching stuff. And that always has like a free 30 minute consultation. So you can just kind of tell me a bit about what you're looking for and we can see if you're a good fit. And if not, I can definitely refer you to someone who is probably a better fit for you than, than I am. Um, and the goal is just to help people and get them with the best person that's for them. So I'd just say through Instagram, probably the best. Most people have Instagram now and yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, thanks a lot, Carlos. That was a lot of fun today. I really enjoyed that. And uh, I'd like to get you back on again in the future. We can, you know, I'm sure we could talk for hours about, fun things yeah (laughs) i'd love to come back i'll keep chatting forever thanks carlos 
Thank you for listening. Please subscribe so you can be notified of all future episodes. Purvis Versus is now available to watch on YouTube. So if you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, and share to all your favorite social media platforms. If you'd like to connect with me, I can be reached through my website, ericpurvis.com, or send me a DM through either Facebook or Instagram at ericpurvisrmt. If you want to reach Carlos, he can be reached through his coaching profile on Instagram, which is at symmetrywellnesscoaching.